You're listening to Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski here with Joel Alcon, and we have Craig Earlham on the line. He's a senior market analyst at Oanda. He's based in London, England. Craig joined Oanda in 2015 as a market analyst. Craig, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for joining us. I'm very good. Uh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, absolutely. We always love having you on. So, obviously, the big topic on the macroeconomic news is Greece right now. There's a Eurogroup meeting today. What are you expecting out of that? Well, the optimist in me is hoping that we will get an 11th hour deal. Um, We've seen it so many times before. These negotiations have gone right up to the wire on many occasions in the past. Um, I guess the only problem with today is you never really know know when the real deadline is. I think this is about the 53rd deadline we've had now um, in these talks this year alone. And every time we surpass that deadline, a new deadline gets created. Maybe Greece finds some emergency cash lingering in a bank account that they didn't have. They may be uh, calling in reserves from the different uh, areas of government in order to fund a, a repayment. So, um, I mean, even now, there's, there was talk earlier in the week that there could be uh, some month-long um, grace period that the IMF could offer to Greece after, uh, after the 30th of June. So there always seems to be a reason why these deadlines get pushed back so i think everyone's really hoping now that this is the final deadline that the two sides can come together and form an agreement tonight these can be signed off tomorrow but of course that's not where it ends um it's then got to go be passed to the greek parliament before tuesday now that's going to face significant opposition um, because uh, there's certain members, of course, in, in the leftist Syriza party that do not believe that this is a good deal for Greece. They do not believe that that's, it's sticking by uh, the mandate. So it's going to probably or possibly rely on support from opposition parties, but then it's got to pass through other parliaments as well. So uh, in, the, in, in the German parliament on Tuesday, it's then going to have to get approved here as well. So an agreement today would be fantastic. I think it would uh, please many people. It would please the market. It would take away a lot of that uncertainty. But we can't uh, kid ourselves and think that this is the final hurdle. It's not the final hurdle this week. It's not the final hurdle uh, this month. And to be honest, all it's going to do is kick the can down the road for another six months. So it's not the final hurdle by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, do you think they're just going to keep expanding the deadlines every time they don't come to an agreement? That's all they can really do. I think Greece has reached a tipping point now, and that was evident by January's elections when they brought in an anti-austerity party, really the first government in Europe to bring in a truly anti-austerity party. Um, I think it became very clear then that they'd reached the end of their tether, um, that they were going to accept, they weren't going to accept much more really, and a third bailout program would come with many uh, conditions attached to it, as the first two did, and it would not be the type of uh, bailout that Greece, the Greek people, uh, the new Greek government would accept. Um, So the only option really now for uh, the Europeans, uh, the only option for the IMF really is to do these small deals little by little. We'll offer you this uh, little bit of money to keep you going for a few more months in exchange for certain uh, reforms and then when Greece can get back on its feet then they will hopefully allow it to get back on its feet um, and then, then then we can start to move on but I don't think that's going to happen really anytime uh, too soon um, I think we're probably just going to see these six months deal maybe now for another 12 months or so and hopefully we can start to move past it but we thought we were going to possibly move past it at the end of last year when Greece returned to their debt markets but we <clears throat> we all saw how quickly that turned around. What are the implications for the European Union right now? I mean, they're trying to include strong currencies like Germany's DAX, but then you have Greece with all this debt. What would what would the implication be if they're really not able to work it out with Greece and Greece wants to go for a, a Grexit? That's the term. <laughs> That's the term that we've all uh, learned to love <laughs> and then become sick of. Yep, yep. Um, I think the implications for Europe, I mean, to an extent, they are unknown. I've got to be honest. Uh, they, there's, there's so many. You hear so many um, reports about what, what, how it could impact certain countries. What is, uh, the, what is the effects going to be for the other periphery countries like Italy and uh, Spain? We've heard so much that the banking system has been shored up so much um, that it's not. It's far more resilient to a uh, Greek exit. We've heard about how the economies are fiscally more responsible now, so are less impacted by a Greek exit. But I don't really buy into all that because 
for one, I do think there is some susceptibility to uh, Greece exiting from a fiscal uh, and, and from a, a banking uh, aspect, uh, if it, even though it's not possibly as big as it was back in 2010. Mm-hmm. But then it, it's the, there's two other aspects, really. There's one of if Greece leaves the euro, it proves once and for all the euro is an irreversible. And this is something that the Europeans have stood by ever since day one. And right. the moment a country leaves, it, it, it loses that irreversibility. Um, and it almost incentivizes any other countries that are feeling hard done by, any other countries that are not enjoying uh, the all this austerity, shockingly, uh, that is being imposed on them by who they believe are uh, unelected officials. So uh, for the likes of Spain and Italy, where there's, we're getting all this austerity again, the, it's, the, it's not the elected officials that are imposing this on them. It's external, uh, unelected, uh, in, in the eyes of the uh, Spanish and Italians, or even going to the Portuguese and the Italians who have had the bailouts. It, the, this is all being imposed upon them rather than things that they have voted for personally. And you've got the rise of other anti-austerity parties. In, the, in Spain, for example, Podemos is one of the most popular parties in Spain. We've got elections in December this year. If Greece left the Eurozone now... This could incentivise people in Spain to say, do you know what, we've had enough as well. Let's vote in for Demos. We can fight them. We can leave as well. And the whole uh, European, the whole Eurozone project uh, starts to fall apart little by little. So it's not so much the impact that Greece leaving would have on the Eurozone as the biggest threat. It's the precedent that it would set. And I think the light, if Spain left the Eurozone uh, next year, for example, that would have a far bigger impact. And I think the whole thing would start to crumble uh, as a result. Right. I mean, that's exactly what I wanted to touch with next. I mean, hypothetically, let's say Greece leaves leaves the European Union. Would that be a watershed and just kind of possibly even start the collapse of, of the European Union and the euro itself? There's obviously no guarantees that it would, mm-hmm. but it would certainly open the door to it. It would uh, it would certainly uh, incentivize um, anti-austerity parties in other countries and maybe uh, get gather support for people who have become disillusioned with the idea of a monetary union. Um, they've not even experienced what the fiscal union is going to be and how that's going to impact them. If they've become disillusioned with it already and think that what's to come could make uh, matters even worse, then that incentivizes them to vote for these parties which could ultimately lead to the exit of the eurozone i do think that if greece left the euro um it, i do think you'd see uh, more of a, a rise in uh, in these anti-austerity parties unless um the reports coming from greece in the next 12 months were ones of um of pain and um suffering as a result of them not being a member of the eurozone um it really would uh, it really could have a, a hugely negative impact especially if if greece left the eurozone and they, uh, the reports coming from there were positive and they were, they, they, people felt better off not being a member of the Eurozone, then why wouldn't uh, what parties in, in Spain and Italy and uh, Ireland or uh, Portugal alike where they're, where they're seeing um, a lot of difficulties and a lot of hardship, why wouldn't they then vote uh, for the same? Yeah, that's a great point as well. Uh, So switching gears a little closer to home for us, let's talk about the U.S. Federal Reserve meeting last week. Just they kind of repeated more of the same, saying they really want to see stronger economic data before they feel confident with raising rates. We had one jobs number recently that came out that wasn't as high as expecting, but we had U.S. GDP this morning. What's your outlook for just U.S. Federal Reserve and interest rates right now? Well, it's funny that <laughs> the Fed's actually fallen off the radar to an extent. Even last week's meeting wasn't uh, it was covered, uh, but it, it, it wasn't the focal point like it has been, like it usually right. is. The yeah. markets can only really focus on one thing at a time, it seems. So I think <laughs> if we do see this Greek deal uh, agreed this week, I do think we'll see uh, everyone start to focus again on the Federal Reserve. And for me, little has changed. I still think we're going to see a, uh, um, a rate hike in September. I think the May data has really justified uh, the, 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 the calls for a rate hike in September. Higher wage growth, higher spending. These are things which lead to higher inflation and at least higher inflation expectations. And that's been the one thing missing um, from the U.S. Uh, this year because of that slow start uh, predominantly. Uh, and obviously lower oil prices has played a, a huge part as well. Um, but 
Um, yeah, for me, nothing has really changed. The jobs front has been strong all along. We've got 5.5% unemployment, uh, great jobs growth every month, of course, one or two falling slightly short. But overall, uh, the overall uh, job creation in the US has been extremely strong. Um, so now that the uh, inflation aspect starting to be removed, I see no reason why we won't see a rate hike in September. And the important thing is last week, the Fed did nothing to suggest that it wouldn't come in September. What they were wary of is a strong dollar. And I think that's why they put so much emphasis on interest rates staying lower for longer and the rate of increase being much slower in the past because they wanted to send this dovish message without focusing too much on when that first rate hike would come. They've repeatedly stressed that the timing of the first rate hike is not as important as the path of interest rates um, following it. And they've seen that this has had little impact because we've seen how much strength has been in the dollar. So rather than talk too much about the first rate hike, they really did focus on how much slower the path of rate hikes is going to be uh, in the next few years. And finally, that message started to filter through to the market. And I think we may have potentially reached a turning point in the markets now. Uh, we saw a similar thing when we were, uh, when we were, had the taper tantrum previously. Everyone was terrified of what impact uh, tapering of these asset purchases could have. And the closer we got, the more people started to accept that it was going to happen. And I remember it was about two or three months before uh, the Fed announced that it was going to taper its asset purchases. Um, there was a big hint dropped. We're going to taper it in a few months' time. And the markets didn't really react because all of a sudden everyone was thinking, well, what are our interest rate hikes? When's the interest rate hikes going to come? Is it going to be 12 months, 18 months down the road? And once people start to accept that something's going to happen, I think people start worrying about the timing quite so much. It doesn't really matter whether it's September, October, even November, December. That doesn't really matter so much. It's coming this year, or the chances are it's coming this year. And if it's not, it's going to be very, very early next year, but it's better uh, in, all, in all likelihood. So really, what's important to the markets right now is what's the path of interest rates going to be. And I think that's where the attention is now turning to. Craig, what about the GDP, uh, you know, figures and estimates that have come down for the, this year and for next year? A little bump up in 2017. I mean, that that doesn't exactly, you know, signal overall strength in the economy. Well, I've, I, 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 to be honest, I've kind of stopped paying too much attention to these uh, GDP forecasts because, they get revised so many times that eventually they're going to be right, but they only tend to be right once they've started revising the figures that they've already released. Um, I, they, they've, they've been so wrong in the past. They're only really an indication. I mean, God, if we'd have looked at uh, the GDP forecasts for the first quarter of this year in the second quarter of last year, I'm sure they'd have been far different from what they were. Um, all you can really focus on is how the economy is performing now, in my view. And right now, we had there was that disappointing first quarter but, I mean, even if you compare the first quarter of this year to the first quarter of last year, which people don't seem to be doing too much, which surprises me, to be honest, because they, the first quarter of this year, they faced massive, massive headwinds from the oil price declines, from the strong dollar, uh, from the poor weather conditions. And yet the economy's only shrunk by 0.2%. The first quarter of last year, the economy shrunk, I think it was, what was it, 2.7%, 2.8%, and they didn't have half the amount of headwinds. That, to me, suggests the economy is far more resilient than it was in the same period last year. And therefore, for me, I think that it's on a far better footing uh, going forward. The consumers have got the benefit of the lower oil prices. I think the, the evidence suggests that the reason why, we didn't, why it took so long to see the pickup in uh, retail sales and the consumer spending, for me, it looks like they were waiting for the wage growth. It's all well and good having this one-off bonus that you don't know when it's going to come around again. It's another thing altogether when you're seeing your wages rising. That makes you confident that you can go out and spend a little bit more money because you know that's going to happen month on month, year on year. You don't know when the next... Uh, when the next tax break, effective tax break, is going to come from lower royal prices. Okay. Uh, let's just move on. Let's just uh, touch a little bit on the crude oil market. I know you cover there as part of your position. Uh, big quiet lately here. Uh, a lot of people have been calling for, you know, the lower 40s and whatnot. And other than the bull camp have been calling, you know, to get a bounce back up into the 70s. But uh, all in all, what do you make out of this recent consolidation? I mean, if, if you actually go back, considering the volatility uh, that we've had in the year here, I mean, this is a weekly chart. I'm looking at a weekly chart of crude oil futures here, and we have stayed in a range between 57.50, really, and 62.50 here uh, since going back for the third week in April. What's your outlook on crude oil? 
Yeah, um, I mean, it, I think it's it has stabilised. I think it was inevitable that we were going to see so, it stabilise eventually because there was so much volatility in the oil markets for uh, such a long time. Uh, there has to be some form of uh, stability that, to appear. Uh, um, I think we could see some moves higher, though, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, I Yes, of course, we are uh, seeing... Um, we're going to see some more production and we're going to see some more supply return to the markets. Um, this can come from the efficiencies being driven in the US, come from uh, additional uh, oil coming from Iran once the sanctions are lifted. Um, but at this moment in time, I think there's more chance that we're going to see uh, continued uh, supply shortages. Uh, uh, and I think, to be honest, I think Potentially, uh, we are going to see higher demand, which again will act to drive prices higher. And from a technical standpoint, I still think we've got a little bit of way to go. Maybe 64, 65 levels is where I'll start to become a little bit less uh, bullish. But I don't see too much downside right now. We're not seeing these massive uh, increases in supply in the in the oil markets. We're still seeing inventories uh, reducing every single week. Uh, crude oil inventories, for example, uh, when they're released today, actually, is, uh, we're expecting a 1.8 million draw, 2.7 million last year, uh, last week, 2.8 million the week before. While we're still seeing these draws, it works in this, exactly the same way as um, as when we were seeing the massive builds in inventories. As long as we're seeing them. Again, sorry, we we we, and we mentioned uh, when we when we've spoken in the past, we were seeing that the oil rigs were being closed down. We were saying that they've been reduced by more than fifty percent. But as long as the inventories were rising, uh, prices were coming down, and I think the same works in this way. Uh, we are going to see these uh, these oil rigs reopen again. Uh, we are going to see production pick up. But as long as we're seeing inventories. Uh, 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 decreasing, then I think we do the the upside potential is still uh, there in in these crude prices. And uh, moving to the gold market, I mean it caught a bit here after the Fed meeting. Uh, I just the market saying that boy, the Fed doesn't know they're not fighting inflation here. Got the bump up to twelve hundred and then just failed here. Any outlook on the gold market? Um, yeah, I mean, gold, really, gold is in long-term consolidation. We do see, keep seeing these moves up to 1,200, maybe even as far as 1,230 when we're getting really punchy, back down to maybe these 1,130 to 1,160 levels. But really, we're not seeing a huge uh, trading range uh, developing. We're not seeing any broad-based moves, similar, uh, anything close to what we've seen uh, previously. The last ma- massive move we really saw was um, was back in March. We've seen a lot of consolidation then. Really, the upper the upper bound around that 12:30 level, lower bound around the 11:70s. It really does. It's, it's hard to really. I think long term, this is looking bearish. Um, in terms of when it will make that move back down to the 1140 uh, to 1150 levels, I, it doesn't look like there's anything really driving it right now. I think we're waiting for that dollar strength to come back. It's going to be dollar strength more so than anything that's going to drive this lower. And a dollar strength is going to come from that uh, first Fed uh, rate hike. So maybe one of the reasons why we've seen um, a little bit more uh, upside over the past um, few weeks or so is being driven by what I said earlier, that markets can only seem to keep their attention on one thing at a time, and people have been focused on Greece, which has given uh, gold a bit of time to consolidate. Obviously, the Fed meeting, we saw it push higher because they tried to come a, a give or uh, tried to offer a very, um, uh, a very dovish tone. Uh, but I do think in the longer term, in the, in six months' time, for example, I do think we're more likely to be far more likely to be down at the 11.30, 11.40 levels than we are back up at the 12.30s because I do think we are going to see a Fed rate hike. And naturally, that provides a lift to the dollar. And even more naturally, um, or just as naturally, that tends to weigh on gold prices. Craig Erlam, Senior Market Analyst at Oanda, joining us covering Greece, crude, oil. I guess we don't ever talk to you about stocks that much. you have any, any favorite stocks that you, that you own or would like to own? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm far more on the uh, macro side. So okay. for, me, for me, it's more commodities, FX. Even indices, um, I don't delve into single stocks too much, if I'm perfectly honest. That's not my particular area of expertise. Well, what do you think about the S&P 500 index? we got about 30 seconds here. Uh, what do you think? Knocking on the door, all-time highs here? Is it just a matter of time before we bust out? 
Yeah, I do. Th- I do think we can bust higher in the S and P because um, what we're seeing now is we're seeing this move over from bonds to equities we're selling it's been what five or six years that we've been in this bull market for uh, bonds and now we are starting to see this rotation into equities so while people say that the uh, rate hike can actually potentially weigh on equity markets equally people are getting more optimistic about the economies that naturally provide a lift so i think this uh, rotation is going to continue into equity markets and it's only a matter of time before we do see these uh, all-time highs being broken Okay, great comments. Craig Erlam, Senior Market Analyst at OANDA. Thank you. And now we're going to go to Brianna to preview tomorrow's show. Thanks, Craig. Have a great day. Thank you.